going to leave my video and leave it alone. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Is there a way for me to get your box out of here? You can still see it. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll just leave it. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I guess it is, depending on where you are. Um, and thank you for the invitation to um, speak today. And um, so I'm going to say I'm not a grass expert. I'll just lay that out there right there, but I have worked with several invasive grasses. And when I started working on how to do this presentation, I was like, yeah, that's going to be a really big topic. So I went into Ed Maps and just to see how many non-native and or invasive grasses there were across the Southeast. So how big of a topic this was. And so I got into tools and um, training here in Ed Maps and looked at um, invasives by category and by each state. And so like here's the results for Alabama. We have 109 reported non-native or invasive grasses. And across the Southeast, the average, average number of grasses was actually 106. So obviously a lot more than can be covered in an hour. So then I thought, well, let's see what the top 10 grasses are based on reporting in EdMaps. And um, this is kind of back of the envelope calculations. They don't actually have a category of way to this rank in EdMaps, but this is what I calculated. So Kogan grass was definitely the top. There's Japanese still grass. If you're just joining us, please go ahead and mute yourselves. I'm sorry, Dr. Lowenstein, I'm terribly sorry no for that interruption. Let me see if I can find out who's doing that. Yeah, I'll just give you another second. Okay, I appreciate that. Sorry about that. Okay, we are good to go. All right, so then the top 10 were Kogan grass, Japanese still grass, torpedo grass, Johnson grass, Altescu, Bermuda grass, giant reed, tiny silver grass, miscanthus, weeping love grass, and golden bamboo. I was like, okay, this is still a pretty big topic to cover in an hour. So what I decided ultimately to do and what I'm going to cover today is the three species that I know best of these, so Kogan grass, Japanese steel grass, and golden bamboo. So I'm gonna um, just dive right into Kogan grass, spend most of my time there, but then um, get into Japanese steel grass and bamboo. <laughs> All right, so Kogan grass, Imperata cylindrica, one of the top 10 weeds in the world. It is a federal noxious weed, also quite a fire hazard, burns very hot has very little wildlife value, inhibits growth of other plants, mm -hmm. spreads very easily both via the wind and on equipment, and is very difficult to control once established. So this is a distribution map that I had from back in 2017 when I had done a talk on Kogan grass. And here is the distribution map for 2021. I think to notice that, so there was about four new counties in North Carolina with um, reported infestations. I think it was two in South Carolina, about one in Texas, one in Louisiana, a few more in Mississippi and darker green in Mississippi. And just going backwards, here's Alabama 2017, here it is in 2021. It's like, oh my goodness, what happened to Alabama? I think a lot of this, there is some spread, like 15 more counties had reports, but a lot of this is incorporation of other data sets into the EDMAPs. But notice, we have almost every county in Alabama now has a report of Kogan grass, and Florida does have a report in every single county. On Kogan grass. So, definitely widespread in the central Gulf Coast region and into Florida. You guys in the Carolinas and Georgia don't have it quite as bad yet and are you know, making great strides to containing it. But if you're not familiar with Kogan grass, just real quick. So it has um, yellowish green leaves. So it's fairly distinctive yellowish green color, anywhere from one half to one inch wide with sharply serrated edges. 
and it does not have a definitive obvious stem. So the leaves seem to come, you know, out from near the base on, near the ground. Has very distinctive winter thatch that remains standing. And this is a pretty distinctive reddish tan color. So actually spotting cogan grass in the winter time um, is fairly easy. It's a great time to find it. The flowers, two to eight inches long and bright white when they're fully mature. The seed is wind dispersed. And as far as when it blooms, anywhere from March to June in Alabama. So and sometimes even early February down in the southern part of the state, Mobile and Baldwin counties. But further north, it may be early June before they start blooming. And apparently in Florida, it blooms whenever it wants to. Okay, over half the plant biomass is actually underground in, um, in this rhizome system. So the rhizomes have very sharp points. They're segmented. So they're white with these segments, and then they have this papery scale covering on them. And you can just, the evidence of how sharp they are here is that they can actually pierce other, you know, rhizomes or roots of other plants. And they, it also, once they emerge from the soil into the ground, they can draw blood if you kneel on one. Okay, the form often in circular patches, so it is, um, clonal from the rhizome, so they'll spread out, often circular, especially when they're first getting established. It is dense growth, so it's not a bunch grass. You don't see a lot of space here in between the leaves and stems here. And the growth is anywhere from one to five feet tall, probably two to two and a half is probably the most common. I've only been in it a couple times with it up to my shoulders. But so that's a recap of cone grass. And then once again, it is a federal noxious weed. And so oftentimes you'll hear that um, cone grass have an, has an offset white midrib and to look for that for identification. Well, so in my opinion, that's not necessarily a good feature to key in on and for a couple reasons. One is that it's not always seen on cone grass. So here it is, but this photo down here, the um, Midrib is fairly central on this, the leaf blade. And also it's not always this bright white. And another thing is that an offsite offset white midrib is a common feature of many grasses. Okay, another thing we see is that um, there are a lot of morphological differences in coconut grass between populations, both above and below ground. So as seen in this upper picture here, sometimes the leaves are very erect and then others, they're really floppy, which I know is not a botanical term, but it's descriptive. And then we'll also see a difference in how robust and dense the rhizome system is. Okay, just a little bit more about flowers. So one thing we look for when identifying cone grass, another great time to spot it is when it is in flower but it's good to keep in mind that when it looks like this is at the end of the um, flowering period. So if you go out just looking for white flowers, which is what I did the first time I was looking for it, you may miss it earlier in the season because when the cocoa grass flowers first open up, they're actually more purplish than white. And so I followed um, Anthesis here in central Alabama, and I don't know that this is the case everywhere across um, the distribution in the southeast. But from when the flowers first open up and they're this purplish color until the flowers are fully mature, they start to shatter and release their seeds is about two weeks. And then another thing often hear um, or read about cogan grass is that cogan grass has 30,000 seeds per plant. And that always kind of makes me scratch my head a little bit because given that it's a clonal species, it's like, well, what is a plant? Um, so I think it might be a little more useful to have a better understanding of how many seeds you might have per um, flower inflorescence here. So I've, um, based on some work I've done looking at germination and seed counts and what, what have you, 
I estimated that there's about 60 spikelets per inch on a flower panicle. And so you could have anywhere from, you know, 150, 350, 400 spikelets, depending on how um, long the, the flower is. All right, then shifting gears a little bit, but sticking on identification is to talk about Kogan grass lookalikes. And so we have a shovel here, and this was a site that um, we had gone to that um, had been reported that there was Kogan grass here, but wanted some verification. And back in the olden days, we just like, okay, just take a shovel, if you dig it up and you see those segmented white rhizomes, it's Kogan grass. Well, it turns out that's not the case all the time. And I'll get to that. And it turns out there actually was no Kogan grass at this site, but all this kind of does look like Kogan grass. So here's this um, field guide to identification of Kogan grass is a publication that um, Bugwood put out. Um, oh, it's probably 15 years ago, at least now. And then we reprinted it at um, Alabama Extension. And some of the lookalikes covered in this um, brochure, Johnson grass, Basie grass, and slender wood oats, Casmanthium, you know, the foliage at first glance can look somewhat like Hogan grass, but none of these three species have um, rhizomes. And of course, the flowers look very different. And a lot of times where this can be challenging for telling it apart is if you're looking for incipient populations of Hogan grass. So you just find a new little plantlet, it's like, ooh. It might be one of these, especially you know, if it's not flowering. And then silver beer grass, the flowers can look a good bit like Kogan grass. They're held on some longer stems, but they often grow alongside the road. And if you're driving down, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, it's like, ooh, was that Kogan grass? But these also do not have um, the rhizome system. All right. But one species that did not make it into that guide is yellow Indian grass. And Sargastrum nutans. This is a native grass, fairly common across the southeast. And so looks a little, good bit like Kogan grass. Here's a close up. We have the same kind of greenish yellow color, yellowish green color, offset white midrib. Yeah, Ooh, it looks a good bit like Kogan grass. There are some differences above ground. One is that it blooms in the fall, and the flower is obviously very different from the flower of Kogan grass. Here's these panicles because panicles can open up a bit more as it matures. But then it has a very distinctive leaf collar. So here's Kogan grass on the bottom right. So you just have this leaf collar, this gentle slope. You may have more or less hair depending on, you know, there is variation in that in Kogan grass. But here's the leaf collar on yellow Indian grass. So you've got this really distinctive notch. And it oftentimes has this reddish purplish color. That's not always that definitive, but this notch is very definitive. And then if you turn the blade over and kind of open it up, I mean, it kind of looks like fox ears. So really, really distinctive difference there. But here's where it got confusing before, you know, with the just digging and seeing if you've got those segmented white rhizomes. This is yellow Indian grass. So it has a rhizome system very similar to Pogan grass. One other thing, difference that can help with telling it apart from Pogan grass is that you will find some more distinctive stems on yellow Indian grass. So this is actually almost woody, which you won't find that on Pogan grass, at least in my experience. So here's a close up of those rhizomes from yellow Indian grass. The specimen, this particular specimen wasn't quite as bright white, but definitely segmented with those papery scales on them. Two other species that can look a bit like Kogan grass at times are beaked panic grass and switchgrass. And these can have, my understanding is occasionally have a rhizome system that might occasionally look a bit like Kogan grass. All right, then a little bit more about Kogan grass biology. So it is a perennial C4 rhizomatous grass. Also already been talking about the rhizomes. Um, so the 
Foliage has very high silica content, which makes it poor forage. Occasionally, you know, it will be um, consumed when it's um, small and still tender, but typically as it gets older, it's not a preferred browse by any stretch of the imagination. It is very fire adapted. So like I said, that thatch remains standing, so that's a high fuel load, and then it actually burns hotter than our, many of our native grasses. And so here, this same spot after the fire, and this is only a month later, and it's completely greened back up. Another thing, Kogan grass is adapted to a fairly wide range of environmental conditions. It's not super shade tolerant, and it doesn't like having its feet wet for a extended period of time, but you will find it growing in a lot, growing in a lot of different areas, different soil types. Um, one thing you'll notice with all of these photos here, most of these are somewhat disturbed areas. South Alabama, you know, all the, our, all of our interstates pretty much down near the coast look like this with cone grass alongside the roads, cone grass on a forest road, here's cone grass in a pasture. In forest, well, once again, it's not super shade tolerant, but it will tolerate some shade. Um, also often comes up in flower beds, often see it at the edges of food plots, comes in on fill, dot, fill dirt in rights of ways. And here's one in the middle. This is, this is the Mobile Bay. So this is high, this is sand, and this is cogan grass growing. And this is growing under a deck. So a lot of different areas. All right, so a little bit about impacts of cone grass. It definitely can impact biodiversity, reducing, you know, when you have this dense stand like this, there's not much else growing in there. There's, it reduces natural regeneration of any overstory. It's mentioned it burns very hot, so it alters fire regimes, both in intensity of fires and frequency. There's some studies showing it alters nutrient availability. And this, I just found this um, study came out in 2017 um, documenting the impacts to forest productivity. So this was an estimate from Florida of $35 million per year um, impact to forest industry in Florida. Um, as mentioned before, little value to wildlife and there's several studies showing that it might be allelopathic. I think most of those studies so far have been in greenhouse or um, lab studies. I'm not sure that those have been taken to the field to, for verification, you know, how much of a role allelopathy plays in the field. Bottom line is we still need a lot more research on the impacts of cooking grass. All right. So a little bit more on how cooking grass reproduces and spreads. So rhizomes and seeds both. And just to emphasize again how extensive that rhizome system is. So here's a fire plow going through um, cooking grass. And, you know, it looks like spaghetti. Those are all rhizomes. And here Cone grass grown in a pod, a lot of times the rhizomes will just circle the outside of the pot, but you can see how extensive they are and how they grow. And so there is a bud at each of these nodes on the rhizome. And this really shown clearly here in this photo on the bottom. So we still don't there's been some studies, but I think there's still some questions about how large of a piece of a rhizome is necessary for spread, how long they remain, remain viable. But they certainly do remain viable for some time. And probably even longer if they're in, in soil. Okay, and so how are they spread on equipment? This is a fire plow with the coke and grass rhizomes on them. Congress gets moved along with graders on forest roads. Ditch maintenance, if you're bringing in fill dirt or just moving fill dirt along. And then other areas where you bring fill dirt in. 
And then for seed dispersal, seeds are dispersed, um, probably most natural dispersal is through the wind. And then we move them around with, you know, gets on vehicles, especially if you, you know, if people mow through cone grass when it's blooming, get flowers and seeds stuck on other equipment. Of course, clothing picks up a lot of seeds and pets, and then also agronomic products. So this picture here, so here's a sod farm. In the background here in the foreground is cone grass. So, and cone grass in bloom. So odds are there's probably some seeds in this sod. And a lot of, in Alabama, a lot of our um, horticultural production is in South Alabama, where we have most of the most dense um, cone grass infestations. And then here, I showed this picture before, but, and this was taken by Patrick Waldrop, used to work for the Alabama Forest Commission, which is a wonderful photograph showing um, cone grass in a pasture. And luckily they bailed this up before it was going to bloom, but you know, odds are there may be some seeds in this. All right, one thing to keep in mind too with flowering is that it can be stimulated by burning and other disturbances. Here's a site where we had done some cone grass research down in South Alabama. This is the exact same site. One part of it was burned, like here in the background of this picture, you can see it was burned. Here it wasn't, so you have a high thatch remaining and not as many flowers this was burned and look at the flowers okay a little bit about seed production so cocoa grass is thought to be an obligate outcrosser so it only has successful pollination if you have plants of different genetic background that they can exchange their pollen Generally, what people have found is that seed set can be highly variable, but if the seeds are set, viability is high. So essentially, cone grass doesn't always set seed, but when it does, they germinate. Has no dormancy requirements. Seed longevity is typically less than a year, so it doesn't form a seed bank. So that's good. Seedling survival um, based on some studies has shown that it's usually less than 20% after one year. And you can see these, these seedlings are really, really tiny. And this is some data, this is from a lot of different studies. All right, so often get questions about whether, you know, about whether there's regional differences in cocoa grass seed production and whether these outlying um, populations of cone grass produce viable seed. And just going back to the picture of cone grass um, in a pasture. So here it is showing up in the middle of a pasture in Tuscaloosa up at the northern part of the range. And odds are, you know, they might have brought in hay from somewhere else, might be how that got introduced to the spot. But I digress. Anyways, so there, yes, there are regional differences in cone grass seed production and outlying populations of cone grass can sometimes produce viable seed. So it might depend on whether this small population was started by rhizomes. And if it's, feedback there. If it's simply a clonal population or if it was started by a seed, a lot of times you get a clump of seeds starting a population. In that case, you do have some genetic variation there and you might get seed production, viable seed production. All right, so in summary then with as far as the seed production, so cone grass seed production is variable across and within regions. So this is based on some research that I did. So I found that the highest production of viable seed occurred within the occupied zone. So down in South Alabama where there's cone grass everywhere. But even within that area, Seed production was still highly variable. Some populations produced a lot of seed, others hardly any. And then, but seed production out in those, um, from populations out at the edge of the range, it was sporadic, but it did occur occasionally. So bottom line is that spread by seed cannot be ignored. And another thing, 
to keep in mind with the seeds is that they may be present before the seed heads appear fully mature. So, you know, before the seed head is shattering and scattering wind, scattering in the wind, you may have mature seeds there, which is just to keep in mind if when you're entering um, cocoa grass that's in bloom or tempted to mow it. All right, treatment options for cocoa grass. So one thing, it can be controlled with tillage in areas that you can access. So you have to have repeated frequent tillage over time so that you continue to break it up and don't allow it to um, build its reserves back up. Another option is to you know, break it up, let it grow and treat that new growth with glyphosate. One thing to keep in mind though is infrequent tillage can actually um, cause it to grow more robustly and make it spread more readily. And another thing to keep in mind is to very, be very diligent with cleaning equipment after um, tilling an area. And then, you know, I mentioned before that we often see cone grass or we do sometimes see cone grass at the edge of field plots um, or food plots. And, you know, Likely the way it got there is that someone took machinery up from an area that had coat and grass and into an area, to another area, and then spread it that way. So, clean equipment very carefully. A okay, coat and grass and burning. So, fire cannot be used to control coat and grass. As mentioned, it just comes rip roaring right back, can actually, you know, be a fire hazard in if you burn at the wrong time of year. As mentioned before, it stimulates flowering, so you could actually increase spread via seed. Um, and as mentioned, it grows back very quickly. So one thing, which is not to say that, cone, that burning it can't be helpful with cone grass control. And one, the way that, that it can be helpful is to burn that thatch off, and then you let this growth, you get this nice, even regrowth Without the thatch, it's easier to spray. You get better herbicide contact. But you still, you need to be careful burning cone grass under very exacting conditions. And know what you're doing. All right, as far as cone grass control with herbicides, glyphosate and amazapir are the two herbicides that um, provide good control. So amazapir, though, soil active, um, so it can't be used in all situations, although it does provide like, better control all around. So typically one application of, of, of mazapir for two or three years will typically get rid of um, most spots. Glyphosate, um, two applications a year, one in the late spring and the fall, worked as well as a mazapir. So two applications, per year for two or three years will typically get um, get pretty good control. Um, so there's also the tank mix. Our research showed that the tank mix of glyphosate and amazapir did not really work any better than amazapir alone. So one thing, um, and for sure, just one treatment of anything is not going to work on cone grass. You have to expect repeated applications. Well, we did find that cone grass can be eradicated on individual sites, but, and our research showed this, and anecdotal, many, many, many anecdotal reports, that some sites are easier to control than others, especially when using glyphosate. And some of our recent research, mostly this is Stephen Enlow and others down in Florida, has shown that there's not, we're not seeing a genetic explanation for that um, difference in sensitivity to glyphosate. So, not really sure what, you know, whether that's environmental, different shade, or maybe it's the, the water used for mixing. Who knows? All right. Also, aminocyclopyrrhochlor and a mix of aminocyclopyrrhochlor and glyphosate show some promise with cone grass control, but more research is needed. The Alabama Department of Transportation is also doing some trials 
mixing perspective, which is a mix of aminocyclopyrrochlorine or sulfuron, and so mixing that with um, a mazepir. And they're using that, their goal is to reduce flowering and seed production while allowing other turf to kind of filter in and cover the area so that you don't have a, just a scorched earth um, alongside the highway. And this is a much slower process, but so I'm not sure if they, this is from a few years ago, I'm not sure if they're still doing this or not, but all right. And with that, I'm going to shift gears and um, talk about Japanese stilt grass now, Microstegium viminium. And you'll notice so I have this huge space here between the two, and that is because for some reason, there are a lot of common names for Japanese stilt grass. Um, probably Nepalese brown top is probably the next common, but Mary's grass, all these other names, or just call it Microstegium. So, Japanese stilt grass is an annual shade tolerant C4 grass. And it's kind of unusual to have a C4 grass that is shade tolerant, but it is. And here's its distribution. First introduced in Tennessee, it's moving out all these directions. Um, so it causes very, it can grow in very dense infestations. It prefers moist soil but it does show high phenotypic plasticity. So it will grow in a lot of different situations. Um, doesn't tolerate drought or flooding for very, um, for any length of time though, but it will grow in a lot of different soil types. So it has both cleistogamous and chasmogamous flowers. So cleistogamous flowers are those that, so they self fertilize and they're those flowers are actually down inside the stem. And then it has the chasmogamous chasmog flowers that um, outcross. They are prolific seed producers. Literature shows the seed bank lasts for one to five years, but I saw some more recent um, studies that showed that it's probably more likely to be on that lower end, probably one to two years out in the field. So as far as identification, the leaves are usually in one and a half to maybe three inches long, have a flat blade, entire margin, and then the silvery white offset midrib. And in this case, the offset silvery midrib can be helpful. Notice the leaves are you know, spaced along the stem, they're alternate. The, the roots are quite shallow out in the field and actually just pulling the plants up can be helpful for identification. And then they have these aerial roots from the nodes. And that's probably these um, might be how it got the name stilt root or stilt grass, because these are kind of like stilts. A few more pictures of Japanese stilt grass. So here's the germinants. And so here in central Alabama, I just went out in the woods around my house and they're just starting to um, germinate here in central Alabama. One thing as mentioned, it's not drought tolerant. Um, so this is, I was looking back over pictures and I've seen it's probably at least three or four times over the last 15 years or so that we've had summer dry enough to pretty much kill the Japanese stilt grass before they got a chance to bloom. Here's the flowers. <clears throat> so can it anywhere from one to three spikes and they'll bloom anywhere from late summer to the fall. And I think the further south you are, the more it's pushed into the fall versus late summer. Typically about knee height, one and a half to two feet. But as you can see in this infestation here, you know, it can get hip high. Both these guys are about six feet tall. So you can get fairly robust. And one thing, so this is um, some photographs from central Illinois. And I've not seen this happen down here in the southeast, but here up there, Japanese stilt grass will sometimes grow as these sprawling plants that reach six feet in length and the thatch remains standing into the winter and it can present a good bit of a fire hazard. So here, the thatch typically decays quite rapidly in, in my experience. 
All right, so here's a publication that um, is a regional publication um, done with so it's Alabama Extension and Illinois and the Budwood folks and River to River um, Cooperative Weave Management Area. Just once again, this showing the highlights of Japanese silk grass identification, the silvery white midrib, the leaves along the stem, the delicate flowers, one to three spikes, that thin, thin weak root system and the stilt roots. And it goes into um, some of the lookalikes, wavy leaf basket grass, white grass, nimbleweed and smart weeds. And a lot of times these, all these species grow in the same habitats that you find Japanese still grass. All right, so where are you likely to find still grass growing? Typically in this kind of site here, we're riparian forests, very moist soil, typically high shade. So it is shade tolerant, but it's not gonna grow quite as well with really, really dense shade, but this kind of, high shade, it really likes. According to FIA data from 2008, there was about 650,000 th 650, acres of forest land occupied across the Southeast with still grass. Of course, other areas where we're starting to see it. So here's um, Japanese pine in a, or Japanese still grass in a pine plantation. This is just here in Auburn. And it's not a huge infestation, but there's some of it scattered. <clears throat> this is another pine plantation down in Clark County at the very southern edge of the reported range. It, and, and once again, this wasn't a dense infestation, but it, I was really surprised to find Japanese still grass growing here. And then here is um, still grass on Edisto Island, South Carolina. This is almost pure sand. The you know salt water was probably half a mile away very dense, still grass growing alongside the road here. Also getting reports of it being problem in um, yards and areas like that. All right, so potential impacts, many nutrient regime can be impacted, microbial composition, litter depth, also some indications that it may be allelopathic, um, impacts to plant biodiversity. It's unpalatable to deer, and then there's some really interesting research out there showing that it, it may alter invertebrate and amphibian abundance. They I mean, you know, actually this habitat encourages um, invertebrate predators that may consume small amphibians. And so it's really interesting interactions going on there. All right, as far as Japanese stiltgrass control, one thing, I mean, it is very easy to pull. So if you have small infestations, you know, that's easy to do. I have a no Japanese still grass part of my yard. I just, you know, keep after it with pulling, but obviously have acres of that, it's not an option. Mowing or weed trimming can be useful to, if, in areas that you can access that way to prevent flowering. Flame weeding can be used in wet areas. And then there's actually quite a few chemical control options, and I'm not going to go into all of these, so to say that it, it is apparently very sensitive to glyphosate. So you can actually treat it with little um, collateral damage. One thing, though, is about using chemical control for still grass is that it, you know, often grows in areas here it is, you know, growing next to trillium. So you have to be careful with your timing to prevent damage to spring ephemerals and other desirable plants. So NC State has some good information on control, as does, I found this from Penn State, very nice publication, you know, going into timing and different options. So it was a great resource there. All right, let me switch gears and talk about bamboo real quick. Okay, so Bamboo is a, you know, it's a broad category of um, plants. So it is a perennial grass. Estimates are 1,000 to 1,400 different species. Most of these are native to Asia, Africa, and South America. 
And bamboos can range in height from in a knee high to 70 feet or more, and you can have diameters of more than five inches, as shown here with the mozo bamboo Phyllostachys edulis. Here's just another shot of that mozo bamboo, the diameter of the cut comb. A lot of variety across species. Let's go through some of these different ones here. And just want to mention that we do have, you know, our native bamboos, Arundinaria, the switch cane or giant cane, and more of a fan shape with the leaf here. And one thing that I find helpful for identifying the native Arundinaria is that this leaf sheath remains on the stem. While it's on the non-native bamboos, it's deciduous and comes off much faster. And our native, um, the Rundin area typically grows in riparian um, areas. All right, just a little bit quick about um, the two main types of bamboos or the two types of bamboos, clumping bamboo and running bamboo. So clumping bamboos have the pachymorph rhizomes. You have very, very little horizontal growth between these nodes. So they don't spread. And most of the clumping bamboos are more tropical in nature. They don't, they're not, they don't do well with temperate weather. And then there's the running bamboos <clears throat> with leptomorph rhizomes. You have more horizontal growth between these nodes. And here are the shoots, just like Kogan grass, you get these buds coming off at each at the, the nodes along the rhizome. And they spread quite a bit. Sometimes, you know, possibly up to 15 feet a, a year, depending on the species. A golden bamboo is probably the most commonly encountered non-native bamboo in the Southeast, but there are others. Okay, one thing I often get a question about bamboo is, is it actually invasive? Um, so three things that often look for when trying to de designate whether, whether a species is invasive is how much it spreads, um, how hard it is to control and what the impacts are, and not necessarily in this order. But and one reason, a lot of times, why people might say that they don't consider bamboo invasive is is because spread by seed is unlikely. So they usually only flower. So like yellow yellow bamboo, golden bamboo, probably only every you know 50, 60 years or so. Um, and then a lot of times it's expected that the seeds are going to fall directly to the ground, not going to spread far. So spread by seed <clears throat> is unlikely, like I said, but they will run unless they're contained. And they can spread quite a long ways. So you will get localized spread. And then another way that they can spread is if we plant them everywhere. <clears throat> of course, control, established bamboo can be extremely difficult to eradicate. And as far as um, the impact, they can outcompete many native species and have very little wildlife value. So for these reasons, you know, a lot of people do have listed bamboos as invasive. <clears throat> so here's just you know, picture worth a thousand words. Bamboo encroaching into wooded areas. Here it's actually outcompeted Chinese privet. Here it is in a pine plantation. Most of the pine has died out over the years. And notice that there's very, very little undergrowth. It's a very dense shade once it gets established. So bamboo control. So the rhizomes are fairly shallow. So if it's an area that you can get a bulldozer in there and a root rake, you can dig it up. But you have to get all of it because it will grow back from the rhizomes. I can kind of think of bamboo as just really, really big coconut grass. So you can cut the combs down and let it regrow and mow it for a really long time. It's going to take quite a long time to exhaust all the reserves in the rhizomes. You can cut it and then either treat the stems or the regrowth. Um, glyphosate and amaz appear at high rates where it's very labor intensive. And the thing with cut stump, it's not been well studied. And so this calm, after you cut it down, that's not gonna sprout and regrow like a hardwood would, plant wood or tree. So what, what you're doing when you're treating this is simply getting, trying to get the herbicide down into the rhizome system. Um, 
And one thing to be careful of, of course, it's hollow. You know, there's a temptation. Let's just fill this up with herbicide. You don't want to do that. You can quickly um, get way over the amount of herbicide that is labeled per acre, the rate. So, all right. As far as using a foliar treatment, if so once you've cut it down and let it regrow, you want to let it get three or four feet tall, then spray that foliage with either a five to 10% solution of glyphosate or 1% of mazepir or a tank mix of, of the two. And treating it in September or October is ideal. But one thing, this is from um, folks down in Florida, so when using glyphosate, you may need to mow and spray as many as four times. So takes a while. Okay, there's, we have a couple publications out, um, Bamboo Growth and Control and Extension, and this is an SREF regional publication. This is actually looking at, there's been interest of growing bamboo commercially. This is, addresses some of the questions about that and talks about um, both control and containment. Okay, with that, just wanted to mention a few resources. So invasive.org, um, scroll down a little bit on the page, you can get to the field guide for identification of invasive plants of southern forests. Um, there's quite a few grasses in there if you want more detail on those species and uh, management strategies and recommended um, control procedures are included as well. And then I've mentioned Ed Maps a couple times and showed their um, those distribution maps. So I just wanted to mention them again. That uh, you know, extremely useful resource. And if you don't use it, I highly recommend you looking into it so you can report sightings and then look at those distribution maps. And with that. All right, left 10 minutes for questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Lowenstein. As usual, I learned a ton and um, 10 minutes is great. We got a lot of really good questions that came in. Right. Um, so, so let's just roll into those. So do you want um, me to, I'll just leave my screen up in case someone wants me to go back to anything. Oh, that's, a, that's a, that'll work great. Um, okay, so, a lot of people ask, we'll just start with this really common question. Um, how often should a site be tilled to control cone, cone and grass? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know the exact number, but I would, I would say, you know, a, a couple times during the season is, and I'm guessing here, I don't know for sure. Okay. Okay. But enough times to so what you want to do when you're doing that you're trying to prevent the rhizomes from growing again and so if you let them grow you know get green material up there they're you know getting reserves back into that rhizome system so right so you can often en often enough that you're not getting green growth there you, you go you don't want to do it often enough to get green growth then you could go in and you know spray with glyphosate yeah, yeah, and then that's what we talk about sometimes, um, an integra integrated management approach where you go after it mechanically, but also use chemicals too. Um, but if you did let it grow back, it'd have to be enough that you have enough leaf material to get enough herbicide into the rhizomes to be effective. True. So you can't, if, you know, if the grass is only, you know, a couple inches tall, that's not going to be very helpful probably. Right, right. Um, so folks were also wondering um, how long, oh, what is the best way to clean your equipment after uh, tilling? Ah, well, part of that's going to depend on where you are. At, at the bare minimum, you can just take a broom or, you know, some kind of tool oh. to knock it all off. If you're in an area where, you know, you have water, you know, you could use a hose to hose it off or ideally take it in, you know, for the high pressure cleaning every now and then. But yeah, for moving from place to place where you probably don't have access to water, just a broom or something else to knock as much off as you can. Okay. Okay. So it can really just be that direct. That's, that's interesting. Well, I mean, so it's better to do that than nothing. Better than nothing. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
Okay, so how long does the seed, uh, cone and grass, um, stay viable in the environment? So probably less than a year. Oh, okay. Um, so some folks were wondering, what are some good native grasses to be planted as a replacement for cone and grass when it's removed? Um, well, so, I mean, it depends on your objectives of, you know, what you're using the space for. Um, but if you want something that looks like cocoa grass, um, <laughs> well, so when we did a study where we were trying to actually overplant cocoa grass after treating it, and species we used were the yellow Indian grass, um, and then purple top tridents. Um, I mean, there's a lot of native grasses, and like I said, it really depends on what your management objectives are for the site. So there was a follow-up that could be an example of that, and you know, I'm I'm not sure if there's an answer, um, but someone was wondering if there are any grasses that could be planted to attract pollinators. Hmm. Yeah, I've know. never heard of any, but I thought it was. Yeah, a good I don't idea. know. Yeah, and I'm not really familiar with pollinator use of grasses per se. Yeah, okay. Well, let's get back to, um, okay, here's one. Uh, does stilt grass need to be treated several times a year with herbicide to control the population? And will pre-emergent treatment deal with multiple seed flushes each year? Um. So I, I do not have personal experience with Japanese still grass control. Okay. Um, my under, from what I was just reading about it right now is that, um, that it is fairly sensitive to herbicide. And I would think that I got the impression that one treatment would work. As far okay. as multiple seed flushes, yeah, I don't, I would think that one pre-emergent would work. I don't know for sure. And I will just say also, I'm not an herbicide expert, never claimed to be. Um, so, but I know if you just disturb the soil, you can get multiple flushes of germination of still grass. That's right. And as always folks, like if you have a specific herbicide related question, the best thing to do is just to reach out to your local extension office and they'll direct you to the pesticide um, outreach coordinator or administrator and they'll be able to and are also legally allowed to give you these direct recommendations, um, whereas a lot of us aren't so um, and you, and, can you know, look, look at the label. As well. Yeah, first and foremost. I'm getting a few more questions coming in, so that's why I'm um, delayed just a little bit. Okay. Oh, okay. So someone said, I saw coca grass being bailed in South Mississippi. Besides being a really bad idea, isn't this illegal? Is it? Yeah, so it is a federal noxious weed. So it is technically illegal to sell products that are contaminated with it. Or, you know, and then, you know, even moving it across state lines. I'm not familiar with exact specifications of the rule. But um yeah, but I will say so cocoa grass is used as um you know it's dried and used in flower arrangements. Sometimes you know you can Yeah I've seen it. I, I've actually bought it at a craft store before. Oh really? But you know that probably came from overseas and hopefully treated properly. Yeah. Yeah, I find it amusing that I have cocoa grass in my hall, but um, that's okay. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, somebody just listed off a bunch of um, grasses that can be used as pollinators. I'll make that public avail publicly available too. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, okay, you spoke of chemical and mechanical controls. What about goats? Um, and then or they mentioned for I think just generally they did not specify, but I think just general. Invasive right. so, grasses control. Right. So goats will definitely, I mean, they can eat it. But so the thing with cogan grass is any kind of herbivore is just going to eat the, the top part of the grass. And then the rhizome will remain living. So as soon as you take that grass, the herbivore pressure off, those rhizomes are likely to grow back. 
So it's kind of like mowing. You're just going to have to keep at it, keep at it until those reserves are completely exhausted. Right. So just right, using right. an herbivore alone would take a very, very long time. Okay. Let me see. Um, if I see an invasive plant in a park managed by a municipality, should I let the local parks manager know? I would. Yeah, that'd be a good, a nice. And, and you might also, another thing to keep in mind is you know, find out what their policies are about reporting invasive plants. And if they're fine with it, you know, it's like reported on EdMaps. Right, right. Yeah. Might have to some people don't want hands. you doing that, but um, especially yeah, but yeah, check, you know, and also ask it's like, hey, do you mind if I pull this up when I see it? Yeah, that's true. That's a that's a good point. Um, sometimes you do have to be the authority on this. It's kind of surprising how many of these things people just don't know. I mean, as often as right. you see. A lot of times you see invasives available in nurseries or yeah, like Dr. Lowenstein was just saying, you can get it in Michaels or whatever, you know, um, sometimes you could need to be the educator. So that's always a good Samaritan thing to well, do. You know, and I will say, you know, the, the dried coke and grass at the craft stores, I, you know, it's not a threat. Right. That's not viable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is bamboo allelopathic? Hmm. I have not seen reports about that you know and the whole study of allelopathy is you know it's it's really hard to study allelopathy it, you know people you can show allelopathic properties of secondary compounds in the lab or greenhouse setting quite easily but it's a lot harder to definitively show what impact it's having out in the real world right yeah and um, that's a good point yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen indication or studies talking about allelopathy and bamboo, but I haven't seen all the literature on bamboo. That's for sure. That was one thing. Just doing this, <laughs> looking in when doing this paper or this presentation, it's like, well, I've not been keeping up with the literature very well on these species. Well, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of information out there. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. It can be really difficult. Um, and speaking of all of these resources, folks, I'm getting a ton of really great recommendations in terms of websites and physical guides, um, et cetera, in the chat box here. I will make all of those available in the useful resources portion that I explained um, about the, at the top where Dr. Lowenstein has already provided a bunch of great fact sheets on the grasses discussed today. Um, and we will also put up a PDF of the presentation there as well if you want to just download it for your own records. Um, that about... Yes, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm going to comb through these questions. I think I might have missed a couple that were coming in while we were speaking here. Um, and um, I'm just going to leave my email address in the chat box. And I can certainly direct those. Dr. Lowenstein, it's, if it's okay if I reach out just over the next week or so, if there's any more that um, maybe I could send your sure. way, um, that would be great. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, folks, I just want to mention before we let Dr. Lowenstein go, before any of you leave, um, be sure to return to your open web browser and complete step two of the webinar workflow to apply for continuing education credits and receive your certificate of participation. Um, and then to rate and leave feedback if you could, because that helps us improve um, our system for you guys. Um, also, I don't know, there have been some adjustments to WebEx since the fall, and apparently now you're also being greeted with two WebEx pages, uh, pop-ups that will pop up at you when you close out this window, you can just ignore those. Don't worry, they have nothing to do with us. Just go straight back to step two. Um, okay, Dr. Lowenstein, we have taken up more than enough of your time, but thank you so much for your expertise today. It's always a joy to listen to what you have to say, and um, it was really great to see you again virtually. Um, <laughs> well, really thank, you. thank you thank again you for the so invitation. Much. Of course, of course, that was tremendous. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting so much positive feedback. So everybody's definitely clapping in their desk chairs. Well, um, thank you everyone. And I'll say goodbye now. Okay, take care. Thank you okay, so bye. much. Bye.